We are talking about the third meeting of the Caribbean states and European Union, CARI Forum EU Consultative Committee of the Economic Partnership Agreement will take place on November 6th and 7th at the Trinidad Hilton and Conference Center. To tell us more is Mr. Gordon Bishfam, Executive Director of the Caribbean Policy Development Center. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Verna. Thank you. You're coming from all the way in Barbados. How is Barbados? Barbados is surviving. We're doing pretty all right. We're yeah. going through some rough times, but we will make it. <laughs> Great. Awesome. So, so let's talk a little bit just to provide some context here. What does the CPDC do exactly? What is its purpose? The CPDC is a policy group. It's a regional NGO with membership across the French, Sp French Dutch, Spanish and English speaking Caribbean. And we build the capacity of NGOs, non-state actors to participate in the development discourse or implementation of programs whether it be environment, whether it be trade, whether it be economic, whether it be social development. How long has this been in existence? We were established in 1991, so we're 26 years old this year. And we primarily started around the economic development discourse that was actually happening in Trinidad in 1991. Wow. So what are some of the accomplishments when you look back on the progress made? What are some of the accomplishments of the CPDC? Well, the CPDC has worked closely with a lot of international organizations like the World Bank. We chaired the NGO Working Group at World Bank for four years and really changed around the attitude in terms of how member states view NGOs. You know, sometimes they think it's a competitive situation, you're, you're against them, that's not the case. We've also developed a gender policy for Barbados and we've also developed an alternative model for development when we were discussing moving over from Lome to Cotonou in terms of the European ACP Development Cooperation Agreement. And we've worked with the United Nations in terms of the implementation of Agenda 21 and Environment and Development, which has now led to the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, as people say, the 2030 Development Agenda. So we've been pretty active on the economic, social, and environment front in terms of trying to put additional choices on the table and to, to supplement what government has been doing, and then when necessary, provide an alternative choice. Okay, great. Now, how does the CPDC actually go about educating its membership, especially about the many implications of trade agreements and global institutions on Caribbean development? Well, we hold a lot of workshops and training to build capacity, but also to build awareness and to make the linkages between economic, social, cultural, and environmental considerations. To look at development as a whole and not see it as standalone or working in silos. Everything is interconnected. So we spend a lot of time building the awareness and capacity of our members and training them in some specifics. Right now we have ongoing programs on climate smart agriculture, sustainable energy, uh, farming, um, women's participation, NGO legislation, and a code of ethics for non-state actors as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the upcoming third meeting mm -hmm. of the CARI Forum EU Consultative Committee of the EPA. What can you tell us about this meeting? What's on the agenda? Well, first, the, the CARI Forum EU Consultative um, Committee is a group of 40 individuals, 15 from Europe and 25 from the Caribbean. And it stretches across the private sector, private sector associations, trade unions, uh, farmers groups, women's groups, and development NGOs in general. So uh, these 40 individuals were selected, 15 were selected by the EU and 25 selected by the CARI Forum Directorate here in, in the Caribbean in Georgetown to monitor and to evaluate the implementation of the Economic Partnership Agreement, to see how it was going, to see how we could integrate another layer of multi-stakeholder um, participation in the process so the voices of the marginalized and the voices of the, the smaller groups could be heard. So we try to bring together a representation of the views of the citizens of the countries right across the Caribbean, and in the case now we have the EU. So those 15 individuals from the EU also try to represent the interests of the European Union. So it's a matter of monitoring and offering an assessment and providing advice to the Trade and Development Committee and the Joint Council, which meets uh, fairly regularly at the member state level to determine how things have been going, if there's any need for reform, and what happens next in terms of the development agenda. Based on your, your knowledge, your information right now, what are some of the recommendations that would be made at this particular meeting, can you say offhand? Well, there, there are a number of recommendations because we're going to talk them through and then make the concrete recommendations. But we had a preparatory meeting of sorts in April actually here in Trinidad where we looked at the agenda. And one of the major items that we're going to be discussing is how do we treat the relationship with the associate territories like Martinique, Guadeloupe, and um, smaller countries here they're actually territories in the region, they're not independent. 
And therefore, we're, we're still trying to establish a relationship with them. And particularly, there's a, there's a system called Octomere in terms of the dock duties. How do we trade our partners here in the Caribbean but are belong to another nation, maybe part of France, maybe part of the Netherlands? There are some dock duties that we have to sort out in terms of to facilitate trade. We want to reduce those costs and therefore do more trade in the Caribbean in itself. Then we generally want to look at the state of implementation in terms of what progress have we made. Are we moving in the right direction? Now, the Cotonou, and the EP, the Cotonou ends in 2020, so we're going to start the dialogue next year in terms of renegotiating what's the situation. And there's some additional uh, complexities, like you, you would have heard about Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, so in that the UK has decided to leave the EU, this could cause some challenges or some complications for the Caribbean, as the UK has been one of our allies. Uh, so we're going to discuss those issues. We're also going to look at, to see how we've been able to harmonize the customs arrangements between the groupings, how trade has been affected, what are the challenges, um, are there some stumbling blocks that we can move, uh, and, and the likes of those discussions. Okay, great. Now, would you say that discussions on the natural disasters and the impact it has had on Caribbean islands, would that be also a topic of discussion? It would not be a main topic, but it will be an ancillary topic because those disasters wipe out the wealth of many countries. So you can take decades, 20, 30 years to build on something. And in a space of 24 hours, it can be wiped out. So we're going to look at the vulnerability and the volatility of Caribbean states and how the natural disasters impact on the trading infrastructure and economic development in general, which then leads to a standard of living and how it can affect on poverty. At the end of the day, one of the major objectives is to reduce poverty. And if you're going to have these disasters cause an additional challenge, then it's something that we have to put on the table. Now, in, in terms of reducing poverty, if we're talking about agriculture and reducing the food import bill, mm -hmm. how do we go about doing that? Well, first, we have to build in another level of resilience in the agricultural sector, increase productivity on the farm, and hopefully increase profit margins. The primary producers, the farmers, usually bear the, the brunt end of the stick, and we want to make sure that they have a sustainable livelihood. That is where we have to start. We have to ensure that there's fair trade, so that along the line of the value chain, everybody gets what's due to them, and there's no one section that's dominating. If the farmers can't survive, the food security is going to be imp impacted. Now, you would know that the food import bill is, is probably about four billion across the yes. Caribbean, and therefore there's a lot of room for import substitution, which means that domestically alone, there's a bigger market that farmers can access. They, sometimes they just have to become more competitive. Mm -hmm. I understand that small island states have some peculiar dynamics, and therefore the production costs are generally higher. But I think that we have to sell the freshness the higher nutritional value of the food produced locally and reducing the carbon footprint of trying to import something from the other side of the world. Now, because um, farming is so highly labor intensive, what can be done to make it more attractive? Well, there's a lot of technology now in farming, actually, and we're doing a lot of workshops on introducing new technologies, particularly in the area of new renewable energy. We want to replace those diesel pumps with solar pumps, introduce photovoltaic to generate electricity at the farm and to look at new technologies in capturing water. Of course, there's a lot of mechanization, but we also still have to look at the soil type. Will the mechanization lead to more compaction, which makes it more difficult for the, the plants to grow in the soil? Or can we do minimum tillage? Maybe perhaps put down mulch, or look at some um, organic approaches to farming. And if not necessarily organic, certainly integrate the pesticide management so we reduce the level of chemicals but still increase productivity. That has been an issue actually even in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the usage of chemicals yes. and farmers being aware or educated on the ratios to use that yes. are actually safe for human consumption. Yes. With that, is that also a topic of discussion would you say? Not directly. We will discuss the agricultural sector in general yes. but in terms of trade preferences. Do we have access to markets? That is going to dominate the discussion. Do we have access to markets and can we establish a market presence in Europe? The provisions of the agreement makes a provision for establishment of markets, but it's been a bit difficult so far. So we have to discuss what are the stumbling blocks and how can we get around them or how can we work them through? Because we want to be as transparent as possible, but at the same time make sure that there is an even playing field. All right, so who are some of the speakers expected at, at this event? Well, as I said, we have um, the, your, our European colleagues, counterparts, joining us. But here in Trinidad, the, the EU representative for the European delegation mm -hmm. will be one of the main speakers on the opening program. So we'll have um, champions of industry and private sector. And trade union representation will also from across the Caribbean will also be here. 
As I said, there's also going to be a strong group of farmers. We even have um, representation from culture and copywriters. Um, so music, uh, culture, how can we make that build more opportunities for our Caribbean nationals? That's going to be discussed. We have women's groups, and we also have development NGOs. We have community NGOs. We have the academia, so the universities are going to be providing a voice at the table. In terms of, we are taking a multi-stakeholder approach in terms of bringing as many views as possible with the hope of building consensus in terms of how can we move forward? How can we assist our member states in ensuring that the development path becomes more easy? How can we create opportunities for citizens to reach out into the world to sell their services, whether it be, whether it be technology, whether they be working with computers, whether it's a new health program, whether it's a methodology in terms of how do you speak to one another? Uh, it will be a, a, an all-around discussion. But there are going to be some specifics where we zone in on the tariff. Have we been able to ha harmonize the tariff arrangements where we reduce the, the duties at the port? And therefore, if these duties are reduced, then the savings should be passed on to the consumers. Commodities become cheaper or more accessible, which means then that the cost of living should, or the standard of living should start to rise. Definitely. Now, uh, if we were to look back at the two meetings, when were those meetings held? How mm -hmm. often are these meetings held? These meetings are supposed to be held every year, but thus far we've held one in 2014 and one in 2016. Now we're having this one here in 2017. What were those discussions like and what were some of the outcomes of those in terms of the achievements? The discussions in the early, in the early uh, meetings of the Conservative Committee was looking at participation. If the stakeholders are getting a fair shake, are they at the table um, discussing the issues, being part of the decisions, recommendations, and more so being involved in the implementation. So it was about the logistical arrangements, and it's also about the rollout. Isn't the EP is an interesting construct. Uh, it is designed to facilitate trade, but at the same time, we have to surf through those potential obstacles or barriers. Uh, it is not that the member states put these things in place to be barriers, but the whole question of natural interest comes into play. How do I facilitate trade in a way that I benefit? as well as the other partner. So it's finding that delicate balance in terms of what has been happening. Have the member states kept to the word of the agreement? Of course, you know, sometimes some member states will drag their feet and move fairly slowly. You know you're supposed to offer a permit, but we don't say when. So it may move from three months to six months or a year. These sorts of things, uh, is there a visa requirement? You know, uh, what sort of um, barriers are in play that because it's a, a case of national interest. How can we get around them? What is the best situation? What is the rate of implementation? What is the rate of absorption of, of the resources that you have? Because there's quite a lot of money involved in these processes. Are, is the money being spent efficiently? Is there a good rate of return? Uh, are processes going? Do we have the human capacity to manage the processes? Because there are a lot of processes, and you can understand, juggling uh, all of these different activities towards a bigger end broader vision. So I guess the purpose of the EPA would be more to facilitate trade. Yes. Okay. Anything else that you'd like to add about the EPA that we should know about? Well, the EPA also has a development dimension. So we look at the whole area of cooperation. Is the spirit of cooperation? Are we using the principles of governance? Are we being guided by the rule of law? Is democracy prevailing? And again, we come back to the whole question of transparency and accountability. There's a movement of a lot of funds. Is the application, is it happening in time? Is there something that we can do better? Is everybody on board? We have the process where you, you agree to be a signatory to the process, but then you delay any ratification. So then the, the entire agreement doesn't come into force until a, a minimum number of countries sign on. And for this particular uh, meeting, what would you say are the top three topics, urgent topics that will be discussed at that meeting? Well, the three urgent topics is that, um, as I said, cotton comes to the end in 2020. Mm -hmm. So we have to start the negotiations next year in terms of what next, what is going to be the character, what is going to be the architecture of the design, how is the, the pullout of, of 